What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of It's Controversial. I'm your host, Zachariah Jazz, and for starters, as is tradition, the land acknowledgement. <clears throat> I'm recording this here on currently occupied Tewa territory in so-called Albuquerque, New Mexico. And today's topic is one that I talk about quite often. The unsheltered community, my friends who live on the streets. So, today I'm going to do a little contrast and comparison to two news articles. One from Source New Mexico, written by a good friend and comrade, uh, Austin Fisher. The second was written and published by KRQE. And... It has a lot to do with with copaganda, right? If you don't know what copaganda is, it's cop propaganda, right? So they basically they basically um, fabricate or or engineer, I guess, stories to fit their narrative, to fit the cop narrative, right? to get more people in support of police, of more police. And that more often than not results in harm done unto our communities, sheltered and unsheltered. And This comes at a time when Albuquerque Police Department is being released from certain parts of the CASA, that's the Court Appointed Settlement Agreement. Basically, they are at 100% um, primary compliance. 99% secondary compliance and 70% operational compliance with the CASA. So they're going to be released from oversight as far as training and implementation of reforms mandated by the CASA. But the independent monitor team and uh, independent review task force will still be monitoring them as far as operational compliance that's in the field um, implementation of policies required by the CASA. So there's a lot going on there, right? A lot. It's like almost It could be used for another push to get DOJ off of the Albuquerque Police Department, which, and I'm surprised that Sean Willoughby and the APOA hasn't already jumped all over it. So, recently, um, New Mexico legislators met with experts to to seek ways of reducing New Mexico crime, right? So that's actually the title of this KRQE um, article. It says, experts weigh in on how to reduce New Mexico crime. New Mexico lawmakers are getting ready for next year's legislative session by thinking about how to tackle crime. To help them consider options, several experts gave them an idea of what works and what doesn't. Last week, several experts made presentations to state the legislators. Now, I don't know if this, if these presentations were publicly available. If anything, if they were, I didn't see anything on it in on Facebook or anything like that on Twitter. Um, nowhere providing access to these. So, last week, several experts made presentations to state legislators. They included Professor Jennifer Doliak an economics professor at Texas A&M University. 
She studies the economics of crime and discrimination and covers the topic by leading panels and even hosting a podcast on justice. We know that people respond to incentives, including repeat offenders, delay exes. So increasing the ex- expected cost of committing crime should deter them from committing crime in the future. What doesn't work, she says, is increasing the length of sentences. That's something legislators have tried recently. The offenders are simply not thinking that far in the future, Delay X says. They're thinking about tomorrow or next week. They're not thinking about the five years that's just been tacked on to the sentence they might start. So we simply don't get much of a deterrent effect from longer sentences. Earlier this year, New Mexico lawmakers debated and eventually passed House Bill 68. Among other things, the new law adds a firearm enhancement to give a longer sentence to violent offenders who possess a firearm, and the Albuquerque Federal Bureau of Investigation announced a gun crime equals federal time campaign. Deterrence, according to uh, Doliak, means increasing the odds that a criminal will get caught. One way to do that, she says, is to have more police on the ground. There's lots... There's lots of evidence that putting more police on the streets and increasing police presence reduces violent crime, particularly homicide, she says. I would say this is the one thing we absolutely know. Recently, law enforcement agencies have tried to increase their presence in in, in crime-ridden communities. Karakiwi News 13 previously reported on how the Albuquerque Police Department has tried to increase its staff numbers. Doliak's presentation to state legislators came at a time when New Mexico's violent crime continues to rise, despite their recent efforts to curb crime. Ellen Rabin, an analyst for the state's legislature, highlighted the issue in another presentation to legislators. Our violent crime and property crime rates have always been above the U.S. crime rate, Rabin said during a meeting Wednesday. More recently, we've seen violent crime increases. Her presentation also noted that the certainty of justice has deteriorated and that swiftness of justice may be slowing in the state. Rabin and her co-workers at the Legislative Finance Committee aren't the only ones to note the problem. Albuquerque was recently featured in an article by The Atlantic and ProPublica, which explored how the slowdown of the state's court system may have led to increased violence. Uh, Annie T- uh, Teigen, the Associate Director of the National Conference of State Legislators, gave legislators, legislatures, gave legislators an idea of what other states are doing to combat crime. Teagan told New Mexico legislators that the federal government is unlikely to swoop in and fix issues in the state. This is kind of what we know. Reducing violence is primarily a local responsibility, Teagan said. Most efforts to counter violence really occur in cities where local agencies and organizations can engage directly with those involved. But she adds that federal support and funding have increased somewhat in recent years. Given the in-depth discussion on crime and the continued rise in crime in some New Mexico communities, Seems likely that legislators will introduce more bills to tackle crime in the upcoming legislative session. The next regular lawmaking session will begin in January of next year. Several several legislators threw out threw out ideas to look into. Now this is something that I like to highlight personally. For example, there was a discussion on using more tracking technology to stop criminals, and legislators discussed the idea of applying to targeted deterrents such as offering resources to at-risk youth offenders while at the same time threatening them with jail time. Despite differing political views and diverse backgrounds, New Mexico lawmakers are coming together over the issue of crime. I would say that New Mexico is really asking the right questions, Tegan said. Now, that part that I'd like to highlight is the legislators discussed the idea of applying targeted deterrents such as offering resources to at-risk youth offenders. How are they just going to throw that out? I'm glad they threw out the the threatening them with jail time part, but why why throw out the idea of offering resources to at risk youth? Why? That doesn't make sense to me. This is that's that's the cornerstone of reducing crime. Is start when they're young. So that they don't so that the only thing to avoid a life of crime being the only thing that they know, right? Because think about it, we all have the one relative who's who's a troublemaker, you know, who's been in and out of prison, jail, who lives a life on paper, you know, under this punishment system. We all know that, and how often are they able to reintegrate into this thing we call society? 
while not while being released from you know probation or parole whatever the hell how often does that even happen and it could all be avoided if we start deterrence when they start committing at younger ages it's it's counterproductive and another part that I'd like to highlight is the propaganda part it says um, deterrence according to Dulac means increasing the odds that a criminal would get caught one way to do that she says is to have more police on the ground there's lots of evidence that putting more police on the streets and increasing police presence reduces violent crime, particularly homicide. I would say this is the one thing we absolutely know. Now, again, I don't know if this is this meeting is publicly accessible, but by reading the sort the the article from the source. This is obviously not the only thing that she said, but it's the only thing that they highlight her saying. And there's plenty of propaganda, uh, propaganda, in on the KRQE website. Look, another Albuquerque business falls victim to burglary. ABD nets nearly thirty thousand and fentanyl pills in two bus. Um, dead teen identified in Albuquerque shooting. Santa Fe can oh no. APD holds a July Vin etching event. You know, this these the, the, those are all propaganda headlines, all of them. Each and every one. I'm sure none of these articles talk about finding a solution for the disparities people are going through that are committing a lot of these crimes. Thirty thousand. Thirty or that's thirty thousand dollars. It's that article, APD nets nearly $30,000 in fentanyl pills in two bus. That's $30,000 somebody needed because of a disparity that they have. Fentanyl pills, they're probably intended to distribute those. That also comes from a disparity that somebody has. People need money. And this is the only way that they know how to get it. So... Now to the article from The Source, New Mexico, written by Austin Fisher, whom I have to thank personally because he helped me out in a very big way just recently. So thank you, Austin. I, I appreciate you, man. You're one of a kind, and there's no words that I have to express my gratitude to you. So the article reads as follows. <clears throat> If authorities and the public, oh, well, the headline, I'm <laughs> sorry, is loss of Medicaid coverage could ramp up crime in New Mexico, lawmaker warns. If authorities end the public health emergency in the fall and allow people to lose access to health care, it could lead to an increase in violent crime in New Mexico, a state lawmaker said in a hearing last week. Since the federal government declared the COVID-19 pandemic a public health emergency, people on Medicaid have been able to stay enrolled in the program and get free health care even if their coverage is up for renewal or their income changed. But New Mexicans are at risk of losing Medicaid coverage when national public health emergency status is expected to expire in October, KUNM reports. Senator Saya Coria uh, Hemphill, Democrat, Silver City, raised the issue during a July 20 hearing in her district about ways to reduce violent crime in New Mexico. This is going to have a ripple effect across her state in terms of economics as well as mental health support possibly an increase in violent crime, Hemphill said. We really need to be thinking about this proactively because that could happen at any time. This is supported by research showing a link between increased health care coverage and reductions in crime, particularly how often people commit a new crime after getting out of prison or jail, according to a report by Legislative Finance Committee staff. The analysts say it's because Medicaid coverage can boost access to mental health care and substance use disorder treatment. Nearly half of New Mexicans are enrolled in Medicaid, and more people in the state count on Medicaid than anywhere else in the nation, they wrote. LFC senior fiscal analyst Ellen Rabin, one of the report's authors, said during the hearing 
that lawmakers should expand ways for people who get caught in the criminal legal system to enroll in Medicaid so they can get medication-assisted treatment. That's another thing that KRQE left out. The state's seen double-digit drops in recidivism when people who return home after being incarcerated get on Medicaid, the LSC wrote. Young adults see substantial benefits from being on Medicaid, and when they lose it, they have they have a much higher risk of incarceration, the LSC's July 20 report states. Children on Medicaid also see reduced rates of incarceration later on in life. That's something that I was just talking about, right? In when I was reading the KRQE article, how they state legislators and lawmakers threw out the idea of targeted deterrence among high risk youth. Children on Medicaid also see reduced rates of incarceration later on in life. That risk is even higher for individuals with mental health issues, the analysts report. There is evidence from South Carolina that cutting off Medicaid when people turn 19 made it more likely that they would be incarcerated within the next two years. Within the next two years, by 15%, said Jennifer Doliak, associate professor of economics at Texas A&M University. Just kicking them off of Medicaid when they became an adult increased their incarceration rates, Doliak said. This was especially true for people with histories of mental health problems, and more people who used Medicaid to buy medication related to their mental health treatment were likely to end up in jail or prison. She said. There is some disconnect, though, between spending to expand health care coverage and immediate results, according to the LFC. Although research would suggest such coverage should reduce the state's crime rates, New Mexico had the highest overall crime rate and the second highest violent crime rate in the country in 2020, that analyst wrote. That points to barriers preventing even people on Medicaid from getting the substance use disorder and mental health treatment that they need, the LFC wrote. And it's worth noting, too, that throughout 2020, people around the U.S. struggled to access mental health care and substance use services. Even as the state tripled its spending on core substance use services between 2014 and 2020, its violent crime rate rose 30 percent, the LFC wrote. The year before that, then-Governor Susana Martinez froze Medicaid payments to behavioral health providers around the state, alleging fraud. Though the providers were eventually were eventually cleared of those accusations, much of the state's mental health care system was destroyed in the process. In 2018, the State Department of Health found that 134,000 New Mexicos needed treatment but were not getting it. DOH found the problem persisted into 2020 and that the biggest gap in treatment was for people with alcohol use disorders, making up over 73,000 people left without care. Use of methadone and residential treatment went down between 2018 and 2020, the LFC wrote. Over the same period as the state increased its spending on these services and increased service delivery by 85%, drug drug overdose and alcohol-related death rates rose by 43% and 49%, respectively, the LFC wrote, whom my mother was a was a part of that statistic, an alcohol-related death in uh, 2020, March 29th, 2020. Although several DOH facilities offer evidence-based programs, some are operating at less than half their licensed bed capacity, the LSU wrote. Doliak told the committee about 44% of people in jail and about 37% of people in prison have a history of mental health problems. This can lead to self-medication, including alcohol and drugs, she said. See, so there's a disparity there. And how often can a felon or any kind of convicted criminal trying to reintegrate how can they how can they get a job so they can avoid being repeat defenders so that they can provide for their own addictions they can't right they can't so of course that's where in comes the crime back to the text about 42 percent of people in jail and 47 percent of people in prison have some kind of substance use, substance use disorder she said Increasing access to mental health care is extremely beneficial, Doliak said. We now have a lot of evidence for this, that increasing access to mental health care prevents violent crime. Expanding Medicaid to include low-income, childless adults gave them better access to mental health care and treatment, and reduced violent crime by 5% to 6%, she said. Increasing the availability of treatment centers for substance use disorders reduces homicide, Doliak said. That... Whatever. Just opening one additional treatment center in a country county reduced homicide rates by 
0.2%, she said. Now, I don't see KRQE's article providing any statistics, right? Look, let's go, let's go back, let's go back to it. There's lots of evidence putting more police on the streets and increasing police presence reduces violent crime, particularly homicide, she says. I would say this is one thing we absolutely know. How do we know that when they didn't provide any fucking statistics there? None. None. How do we know that? Where is Kara Kiwi citing that that is true? Where does it say that she said there's any percentage amount of police reducing crime rates? How? Where? I don't see it. And I've gone through this entire article. This is like the third or fourth time I read it. So let's look into that, right? So the following is from a New York Times article titled, Refund the Police, Why It Might Not Reduce Crime. This is from November 8th, 2021. In liberal Portland, Oregon, which is facing its most violent year on record, the mayor announced a plan on Wednesday to put 200 more police officers on the streets. His announcement came a day after voters in Atlanta and in Seattle signaled their support for mayoral candidates who promised not to roll back the police force, but to expand it. In Maryland last month, Governor Larry Hogan announced $150 million to refund the police, quote-unquote. With shootings and homicides surging in many cities, calls to redirect money to policing are rising. But evidence that hiring more officers is the best way to reduce crime is mixed. Beeping up, beefing up a police force can help, but the effects are modest and far from certain. Those who study the question say any declines in crime have to be weighed against the downsides of adding more police officers, including negative interactions with the public, police violence, and further erosion of public trust. And there is a bigger unknown. How police hiring compares with other anti-crime measures, such as providing more summer jobs or drug treatment programs, or even keeping the same number of officers but deploying them more strategically. For decades, scholars have acknowledged that local crime rates cannot be predicted by officer strength in police budgets. Sometimes a boost for policing is followed by a drop in crime, sometimes it isn't. History shows that homicides fell after more officers were hired 54% of the time, according to Aaron Chaflin, a criminologist at the University of Pennsylvania who has studied ways of driving down crime. Crime goes up and down for a million reasons that are completely independent of the police, Dr. Ch uh, Chalfin said. But we know, on average, if you look across many cities for many years, there is an effect. While crime rates and officers per capita vary widely from city to city, scholars have begun to try to get an overall picture by using data on federal policing grants that were established in 1994. In a forthcoming paper, Dr. Ch uh, Chalfin and his co-authors found that one additional officer reduced between 0.6 and 0.1% homicides per year. In other words, it takes 10 to 17 new officers to save a life. The gains were not uniform. Overall, more black lives were saved than white lives when police officers were added, but in southern cities with larger black populations, the homicide rate did not budge, according to an early draft of the paper. Uh, according to an early draft of the paper. And more officers made arrests for low-level offenses like alcohol-related infractions, which are not typically seen as contributing to public safety. More police officers may also mean that cities incur the most the cost of more police violence, more legal sediments, and more protests. With more national focus on those drawbacks, not all voters are enthusiastic about beefing up police forces, even in cities with sharply sharply increasing homicide numbers. Last week, residents of Austin, Texas, rejected by a wide margin a ballot measure that would have required the city to hire hundreds more officers. Opponents pointed out that while Austin had a record high number of homicides, cities with far more police officers per capita, including Atlanta, Chicago, and Milwaukee, had experienced greater increases in their homicide rates, and cities with fewer officers per capita, including Raleigh, North Carolina, and El Paso, had seen homicides decline. If I read this margin of victory correctly, I think people understand that there is going to be crime, but are more willing to solve the question of why these things are happening as opposed to just responding to them when they do," said Chaz Moore, executive director of the Austin Justice Coalition, which opposed the measure. Because the causes of crime vary from place to place, it can be extra extraordinarily difficult to disentangle the benefits of hiring more officers in any one city. After a rise in gun violence in Chicago in 2016, for example, the city announced that it would hire almost a thousand additional officers, a number officials said was justified by a top-to-bottom staffing analysis that watchdog groups have not been able to obtain. 
Shooting, shootings began to fall before those officers were recruited and trained. As long as Chicago has a cold winter, crime is going to drop, said Tracy Siska, the executive director of Chicago Justice Project, adding that gun violence in 2016 was abnormally high. So you can't say that crime went down because they hired all these new officers. No, no, no. Chicago's crime numbers did fall in 2019, the year that the force reached its peak of 13,353 officers, according to data from the city's Office of Inspector General. But the next year, the coronavirus pandemic and an increase in gun purchases appeared to play a much larger role, making it hard once again to isolate the effects of the police force size. Overall, crime plummeted while the number of shootings surged. There is also the question left largely unanswered by existing studies of how the added officers are being deployed. Does policing the hotspot have the same effect depending on what they do? Stopping everyone, targeting high-risk offenders, or just standing on a street corner with your arms folded looking mean? Asked Jeffrey A. Fagan, an expert on policing at Columbia Law School. Speaking of the practice of flooding high-crime areas with officers, the answer matters, he said, because everybody agrees you get into fewer problems with the public if you minimize the police footprint. Even crime statistics themselves have limitations. They are collected by the police, and the police decide what counts as a crime, said Tamara K. Knopper, a sociologist at Rhode Island College and the editor of We Do This Till We Free Us, a book on abolitionists organizing by Miriam Kaba. The numbers that get most attention are the so-called index crimes, murder, rape, robbery, aggravated assault, burglary, larceny, car theft, and arson. They represent a narrow definition of public safety, and advocates of shrinking or abolishing the police have taken to pointing out that they do not include civil rights violations, violence perpetrated by the police and correction officers, or even failures by those in uniform to take precautions against spreading the coronavirus. In the end, crime data is always a tool of police propaganda. Thank you, Dr. Knopper said. If crime is low, the police are doing their jobs. If crime is high, we need to give more money to the police. The police always win. Perhaps because crime rates are so hard to explain, they are easy to exploit. The spike in gun violence has not only prompted calls to expand police departments, it has given the police an opening to blame crime on policies they do not like, often with little evidence. Derma F. Shia, the New York City Police Commissioner, repeatedly used his bully pulpit to pin the city's increase in shootings on bail reform, exactly like what's happening here, which allows people to avoid being locked up before they have been convicted. But when he was confronted with data to the contrary at a hearing in Albany last month, he was forced to backpedal. Perhaps the biggest drawback of the available evidence on policing is that it does not compare the benefit of more officers on the street with the benefit expanding other measures that have been shown to reduce crime, drug treatment, mental health crisis responders, or summer jobs for young people. In a recent survey of criminal justice experts, about two-thirds agreed that increasing police budgets would improve public safety, but many more of them, 85%, said that increasing spending on housing, health, and education would do so. Nor do they measure the comparative effect of asking the police to absent themselves entirely, as in a five-day experiment in Brooklyn in a Brooklyn neighborhood last year that reportedly saw 911 calls drop nearly to zero. In New York City, a randomized trial of street lighting reduced outdoor nighttime index crimes by 36%. In Philadelphia, cleaning up vacant lots corresponded to a 29% reduction in gun violence. A number of studies have documented the effectiveness of violence interruption programs run by credible messengers who are respected in their communities. In the longer term, Medicaid expansion, access to drug treatment, and mental health care, and even a guaranteed basic income have also been found to reduce crime, perhaps with fewer downsides than policing. I think when one is talking about what's an alternative to just adding police, while well, putting some serious investment into the kind of program for at-risk youth that really gives them a concrete possibility for a real job, said Elliot Curry, a criminologist at the University of California, Irvine. That's where you really get the bang for the buck. Written by Sheila Dawn of the New York Times. So, just as I was saying, just as the last article I wrote, written by Austin Fisher, said, the one that Kara Kiwi doesn't say that reducing crime means to reduce crime you have to provide things that people need people don't get better from jail time people don't get better by getting the shit kicked out of them by the police more police does not reduce crime 
like I said, like I've said many times before, police do not show up until after a crime has already been committed. They they don't they don't stop crime. They only respond to it. And this is how propaganda works, right? Because all over the country, all over all over TV, all over the internet, all the time, all we see is especially from local outlets, all we see is them propping up the police. All we see is them highlighting another killing. All they see is all we see is um them highlighting how homelessness you know, homeless people are, are committing crimes or whatever. And this is to speak on what Albuquerque um, is doing right now in regards to police and homelessness. So, aside from a portion of ABD DOJ, DOJ settlement being suspended. Um, the, recently, the uh, Mayor Keller was talking about closing down um, Coronado Park. Uh, Coronado Park has been sheltering like a hundred, or has been housing you know anywhere from a hundred or sixty to a hundred and twenty people. This number increased when a uh, coronavirus hit. Now, that's what is that going to cause? Is not only displacement because these people have nowhere else to go. This has been their home. One man said it it's been his home for nine years. Right. So what's going to happen? These people are going to branch out into other parts of the community of the city right and then what's going to happen you're going to get more people within these neighborhoods calling the cops because another uh, encampment popped up on the sidewalk and at the same time these same people are against you know sanctioned encampments that's another thing that the Keller administration is considering doing with Coronado Park instead of closing it. But still, people are against that. It's, so what do you want them to do? What do you want, what do you want to do? You don't want them in the city. You don't want them on your sidewalk. You can't just put them all in jail. You can't forcefully move them to, to somewhere that they don't want to be. That's unconstitutional. Locking them up for disparities is unconstitutional. You know? And here's another... Um, another thing. You know, another piece of propaganda from, also from KRQE. This, I believe, has a lot to do with the closing of Coronado Park. This is from June 21st. Officials announced increased police presence in downtown Albuquerque. The Al Albuquerque City's officials held a new co news conference Tuesday, June 21st, to announce the launch of a new downtown program called Downtown Team. The Targeted Enforcement and Active Monitoring, or TEAM, is a program where the city is partnering with businesses downtown to increase police presence. This is not the downtown patrol that walks around during the day. That's going, that's going to continue. This is on top of that. To actually enforce crimes that are happening downtown, said Mayor Tim Keller. The new the new program is scheduled to start after July fourth. Uh, after July fourth, the main issue officials hope to address is public safety. Mayor Tim Keller says the city will be opening a new police station downtown, which is scheduled to be open later this summer. ABD cameras and license plate readers were added to the to monitor the area. They will also be adding lights throughout downtown, including the various alleys. The new initiative also includes having officers present at peak times in the right places like when the bars close on weekends and different parking lots where people tend to gather. Another time highlighted by officials is evening hours when people may be out eating dinner or walking through the area. Many nearby businesses are on board, but the mayor said more need to join the initiative for the program to be funded year-round. We recently had an employee that was shot and killed in the alley, and it was a horrible experience, so I know firsthand about crime down here, so anything that we can do to make it better definitely be happy 
to be a part of. Instead, Steve Batosio, a downtown business owner. Mayor Keller says they have 90000 in pledges for the project that is set to start after July 4th. The funding comes from one Albuquerque fund, which relies on community donations. <sighs> you know, I get it. Every shooting is, is a tragedy. It is. I'm not saying, like, I don't want to say any of this like it's not. But, police presence, like I said, this is not the solution. And it's all this talk, all this talk about more police, policing this, policing that. But very little about giving the people what they need, access to the resources that they need. Shelter is not going to do that. Forcing them into an encampment is not going to do that. A lot of these people state that they don't want to be there because because of how packed it is, any of the, how packed the shelters are, or saying they don't want to stay at the Westside Emergency Housing Center because it used to be a jail. Others think that they can't bring their pets, which is incorrect. This is according to a another article um, by The Source, New Mexico, written by uh, Patrick Lohman. And so there's multiple reasons why nobody wants to go to these shelters. And they shouldn't have to. So then they need to be provided the other things to increase their, you know, quality of life. That's something that should be granted to every breathing person because that's what we are. We're people. We're human. We shouldn't have to work to live. So, yeah, I don't know. I think it's just all bullshit. It really is. Just more copaganda, more pandering to the cops. While they still fail to reach operational compliance to the DOJ settlement. While they're still hurting people, while they're still killing kids. What does the independent monitor have to say about that? What does Sean Willoughby have to say about that? Now things are just going to get worse. But I guess we'll see how it goes. Don't forget to check out and support my mutual aid project that is Hope for the Hood. Uh, we do have a Venmo and uh, an email address, and you can contact me directly through my personal number. It's all on the Facebook page. Um, Hope for the Hood, and on the It's Controversial um, Facebook page. And don't forget also to demand justice for APD killing Brett Rosena and displacing the family who lived in that home. We demand justice every day until we get it. So no slacking. Make some noise. I love y'all. Be safe. Take care of each other. And stop giving, you know, my unhoused friends a hard time. Instead, give them something to eat. Yeah.